Welcome along to Film Talk, and I'm delighted to say we are joined by the wonderful Morris Bright, MBE, film historian and author once again. And this is going to be a fantastic episode because we're talking the Pink Panther series, in particular, A Shot in the Dark. Morris, this was not the first of the Panther movies, but widely regarded A as the best, but also the first in which the formula of Clouseau, the real character of Clouseau, really came to the fore. It was the springboard for all the films to come. What, uh, a shot in the dark. Is it the best film in your opinion? It's 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 my favourite of the series. Um, as you say, I think the first one was made about maybe a year, two years before, which was the Pink Panther. And let's not forget the Pink Panther is not actually a big pink animated panther. It's actually the name oh. of a very expensive jewel that had pink when when the light shone through it. And in fact, uh, Peter Sellers as Inspector Clouseau wasn't really the lead character in the first film. It was more sort of David Niven if you look at the casting. Um, and it was therefore, as it emerged into the second film, and Clouseau came quite more up front, because actually the second film was based on a play, a French play called L'Idiot, L'Idiot, which kind of speaks for itself. Um, and you bring uh, uh, Sellers forward and make that the main character in this, what is effectively a murder mystery. Um, that's when they realized they had something, I think, that could run and was particularly special. It, it, it felt very expensive. It's filmed by MGM, MGM in Bournewood, which is near to Elstree Studios, MGM Bournewood no longer there. Um, they also used the Luton Who estate, big uh, family mansion house, um, as well as going and doing some shots in Paris also. And it had a very sort of um, posh cast. You know, you had Elkie Summer, who God bless her, was 80 a few weeks ago, very attractive uh, actress. Um, you had George Sanders, you had Herbert Lom. So it was, they were, they were people who were, uh, very big names in film, but of course, uh, Sellers' light was in the ascendancy at this stage. He was beginning to pick up some great films, and he went much, much further, much, much quicker after this particular one. But it looks so beautiful. It's got lovely music, lovely cinematography, and it just sounds and looks. And of course, the the humour is very clever because, as I say, they hone into Peter Sellers' abilities, uh, and of course, the beginning of that uh, mad anger that takes place between Herbert Lom's character and Peter Sellers' character, Clouseau, um, as Herbert Long gets more and more frustrated with this incompetent idiot he's got working for him that somehow um, seems to win over the day and it makes him frustrated and jealous. And they came back to there 10 years later. It's quite a wonderful film. Inspector Clouseau's residence. One moment, please. Commissioner Dreyfus. When we talk about Peter Sellers as Inspector Clouseau and Peter Sellers this, Peter Sellers that, but actually it was directed by Blake Edwards and there was always a bit of a, a rivalry, a tension between those two over many, many films. They falling out and fighting over the character and there were arguments too about who really invented the Clouseau character and I suspect it was huge parts of both of them rather than one or the other, but Blake played a huge part in all of this and all the subsequent films too. Well, yes, they were made by Blake Edwards. And one thing that you get very often are the, a creative director and a creative actor. To de together, it brings explosions. Now, that can either uh, be massive detriments to the, to the film or it can bring uh, massive benefits to the film. And I think in the case of A Shot in the Dark, it brings massive benefits and to the Clouseau character because it may well have been that Blake Edwards had said, I want it run this way. But Peter Sellers liked the, the physical physical comedy, not just the words. Um, the screenplay was written, one of the screenplay writers was William Blatty, who I seem to remember, uh, was actually involved with writing The Exorcist. Um, but, that, but that's just a, that's just by the by. It wasn't a horror film by any stretch of the imagination. But no, you can get that. You can get a director and an actor who will not get on with each other at all. And there'll be some directors who say, I'm in charge, these are the words, you do it. But it wasn't about words, it was about characters, it was about looks. And there's that, there's something that still makes me laugh to this day. He, he turns up to this, a nudist camp, which I thought was filmed particularly well for sort of um, the early 60s when you couldn't show anything. Everyone's standing with a bush in front of them or a guitar in front of them or someone bouncing a ball in front of them. And he goes through to this place. He says, I am Inspector Clouseau, in, expecting he can go straight through. And the guy there called Turk Thrust, a cameo by um, Brian Forbes, the late, great Brian Forbes, the director, former managing director of Elstree, you know, Railway Children, all those types of films in, into the studio. So a big name in film, and he, did, he loved Peter, they got on very, very well. So he agreed to do this little cameo role, and he goes up to him, he says, 
right, I'm Inspector Clouseau. And he goes, yes, he said, you, you have to take off your clothes. And he goes, all of them? I don't know why that makes me laugh. All of them? What? This is a nudist colony. A nudist colony? Right. And nobody gets in unless they take their clothes off. But um, all of them? All of them. And of course, Clouseau has to then go round <laughs> with the guitar, walking around, and of course, some gets bumped off uh, in in the in the nudist camp, which is quite difficult to do because there's nowhere to hide your your, your sniping gun. Um, but it's it's just a funny film, and it's made up of various set moments. And of course, the end is like a bit of a pastiche of a of an Agatha Christie, isn't it? Really, a Poirot, mm. where everyone into the living room. So it's a kind of homage to that, but a bit of a pee take at the same time. You know, I'm going to work through all of the people who it is. Well, of course, Pryor would tell you why also would Miss Marple, etc. But of course, in the case of um, Inspector Clouseau, he didn't really have the foggiest idea what was going on. Uh, and of course, he gets to it at the end. And I, I do remember, of course, at the very end of that great scene where Cato, and let's not forget the, the emergence of the, uh, of, the, of the mad Oriental would-be assassin Cato, played by the late Burt Cook, who's also a very good friend of Peter Sellers, who would just turn up, you know, open up mm. your, your bedroom cupboard and out he would jump. Moments of passion with Elkie Summer, he was on the bed jumping on there. And of course, at the very end, he comes and he chases him and he falls into this sort of big fountain outside the front of the mansion house. But it's it's just a fun film and it holds up very well. It was nominated for BAFTA for Best Costume, and but not just Best Costume, but Best Costume Colour, because it was about 1964 and there were still films being made in black and white. So you had two different types of of nominations for certain types of films that were still being made independent, tended to be low budget. But some of the big war films, The Hill and various others like that, were still being made in 1965 in black and white. But it was nominated for BAFTA, so it was it was respected by the industry. Um, and it's just a great, it's a great Saturday matinee film now. You can sit down of an afternoon and have a watch That's right. and have a laugh. And it keeps you warm and keeps you laughing. And there's not that many films from almost, what is it, almost 60 years ago that can still do that. But that's the that's the art and the and the wonder and the magic of Peter Sellers, because he was not a one trick pony. He could do so many different characters. And if you look at that five year period where he starts to do Clozo, but there's so many other great films, smaller films mm. he's doing as well. Character films. Only two can play. Um, a few years after I'm all right, Jack. Strange Love. Things like that. Oh, absolutely. Dr. Yeah. Strange Love. When you think about the main Strange characters. Love. But what's interesting about this as well is Graham Stark turns up as his psychic. But whereas a lot of the characters you've seen, like Cato and, and Herbert Lahm and these others, are playing the same character in subsequent films, Graham Stark, who was a great friend of Peter's, and Peter always used to get him roles in films, turned up in A Shot in the Dark and was fantastic. But he appears in many of the other Panther films, but often as slightly different characters. So it's, so it's almost like Peter keeping giving his mates in work, which he did in quite a lot of his other films with many of, many of his other actor friends too. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, it's, it's, um, he was good friends with Graham Stark, who played, I think, Hercule Lejoy in this film. But of course, as you say, he turns up in the other, one of the other later ones with the old Does Your Dog Bite? I think it was, I think it was, Does Your Dog Bite? And he goes, No. <laughs> and so he puts it, and the dog bites, and he says, I thought you said your dog did not bite. He said, That is not my dog. And so, and that was it. That's a cameo by Graham Stark. But they were very good friends, and they shared a major passion uh, for photography. Members of the household staff have testified that Miguel Ostas beat. Kepa, you fool, you've broken my pointing stick. I've got nothing to point with now. And if you look at a great book that Graham brought out, um, and it's got wonderful shots of Peter Sellers in it. And I went to interview Graham well, a couple of years before he died. He lived about 93. I went to interview him when he was in his 80s. He lived in Finchley. He was quite deaf by then. Um, and so he spoke rather, rather loud. Well, he shouted, actually, in all honesty. But his passion and his, and his love for Peter was still overwhelming and not, none of them really got over it when he because Peter died I think he was 54 mm. in 1980 when so many of the others lived on people he worked with in the goons for example Harry Seacombe lived in his 80s Spike Milligan but but he went he went very early but he did like to have his people around him not just because to get his mates work but also because it was almost support for him so David Lodge a great character actor would always turn up so david lodges in this film i think he plays the gardener but he'll turn up in other films with him as well so david lodge was there as well and so he had this this retinue you know, this, uh, of people that he liked to bring in because he was quite insecure and he liked to have people around him that he knew would support him and keep him going and so yes you will see recurring faces in films but not necessarily in the pink panther films playing the same character and it was 10 years i think it was money that drove them back 
to uh, to make the Panthers again and ten years later they came up with the next one and there was quite a series of them and then a few posthumously after Peter died they never seemed to they became wacky and weird in their plot lines and and stories and characters but they never seemed to lose their appeal I remember once going to see one of the Panther films at the cinema and the infectious laughter it was just wonderful I, I, I remember that day vividly sitting in the ABC watching one of the Panther films and it was just uh, and that's stupendous. and that's a very important point and that it's often forgotten nowadays when people are watching films that as particularly the comedy they are designed to be shown on a big screen with an audience yeah. and I a couple of years ago I went to see a Laurel and Hardy film I'd never seen a Laurel and Hardy film on a big screen with an audience even though mm. I knew it back to back, back to front, but way out, not way out west, it was um, Sons of the Desert, which is just my favourite. Um, I went to see it with an audience of, what, 200 people. And just to sit in an audience with people who are laughing, as you say, you get that. The difference being, of course, everyone knows every line of the film. So you're kind of laughing before it gets delivered. You're laughing when it gets delivered and you're laughing after it gets delivered. So it's three times the laughter, but it was the same with the Panther films. And I remember seeing a Panther film, I think it was about 1977, I was only about 11. It might have been Strikes Again. Um, I lose track. But as you say, they did get brought back in the 70s and it was for money. I mean, Peter Sellers didn't intend, I think, to bring the character back. Like Dirk Bogar didn't particularly want to go back and do any more Doctor films, but got drawn back for one more in 63 mm. after a break of however many years, because very often it's, here's the money, can you do it? And they say, actually, yeah, I will. So they had a sequence of about three of them. I think it was uh, Return, Strikes Again, Revenge Of. I'm not sure in which order, but it was slightly those. As to posthumous ones, which is basically cutting clips together that they that had never been used and making as making out as though Clouseau had 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 been hijacked or lost and they had to go and find him and they got some actors back together to go on that. I, I, I do you know what I couldn't watch it. I could not watch it. To me, that was the nearest you can get to cinematic blasphemy. Do you know what I mean? It was just mm. and, 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 ex, and it was just ex, exploitation. I couldn't do it. I couldn't watch it. I saw a clip of it, but I couldn't watch it. Even though I had some of his friends in it, and they would say it was a bit of a tribute, the fact still remains, Peter Sellers has died. You're cutting together old clips and trying to turn it into a film. If you were doing a tribute, that would be one thing. The Joanna Lumley one, I think this is the trail of, and there's some interesting, some really nice unseen clips, which are very funny. And some clips they say are unseen, you think, hmm, it does look familiar all the same. And then there wasn't there another one, The Curse Of, which was appalling. I didn't have Roger Moore in it playing the uncle of Clouseau, it was just, it was diabolical, really. I mean, it went, I love Roger to bits, and like you, we met Roger, and he's a wonderful man, but it's, it was not the, it was not the right uh, posthumous tribute to Peter. I think no, the living said, years films yeah. were terrific. Absolutely, and if you, want to, if you want to do a tribute, you do a tribute documentary or something, and you interview people, and you put them to say what a great person he was, you don't try and say, the character's been hijacked. No, he's not, Peter Sellers is dead. And he's been hijacked, but we've got some clips of him, so we're gonna stick them in there. It just, I don't know what they were, well, I know what they were thinking, because it was doing very well financially for them. Um, but okay, it, it was what it was. And I'm hearing now that there's discussions once again, even after Steve Martin uh, uh, played, played the, the part, I'm hearing that they're thinking of resurrecting it again or rebooting it again. They just you know, don't know when to leave why, it alone. Why bother? Why bother? Yeah. But as I've said, that for me, yeah, a shot in the dark. Um, it had it all. It was just the right film at the right moment. Looked great. Um, sounded sounded great. Very funny to watch. Some classic scenes and a great cast. And I think all in all, out of all of them, I do like them all. And I do have the box set. It's my favourite. Can't say better than that. A shot in the dark, sumptuous, great performances. It's my favourite too. And uh, a great film all the same. Morris, thank you very much. It'd be great to know what you think, so do leave some comments down below. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to hit that little bell icon to get a notification every time we release a new video. Thanks for watching. See you next time.